Okay, so chapter 39 is another one that our book has kind of lumped some things together. We're going to go over skeletons very briefly, um, muscles and muscle contraction, and then we're going to go over behavior. Behavior might seem like it doesn't belong, but, um, you know, behavior involves movement, movement involves muscles, and your muscles help you move by working on the skeleton. So that's how these things are all kind of tied together. So in animals, a behavior is an action carried out by the muscles under the control of the nervous system. And really more broadly speaking, behavior is how organisms respond to stimuli. So uh, behavior is an essential part of acquiring food, finding your mates, and maintaining homeostasis in general. Uh, behavior is under the influence of natural selection as well, and it influences the evolution of um, an animal and their anatomy or structure. And then, like, again, this chapter is kind of weird, but they put muscles in here because muscles act on the skeleton, so they put the muscles and the skeleton and behavior all in one chapter. If it was me, it would be three chapters, but here we go. Uh, so the types of skeletal systems, this should be a little bit of a review. We've got three main types of skeletons in animals, hydrostatic skeletons, which are fluid-based, exoskeletons, which are external and have hard parts, and endoskeletons, which are internal and have hard parts. So a hydrostatic skeleton consists of a fluid held under pressure in a closed body compartment. Um, there's a really kind of cheesy example here with the glove filled with water. Like if you squeeze on one part of the glove, like one finger, it's going to move another part of the glove there. Um, so water is nearly incompressible and um, hydrostatic pressure um, is used to move the body around. These things are going to be found in things like cnidarians or jellyfish, flatworms like platyhelminthes, nematodes, roundworms, um, and annelids, which are segmented worms. So that's your hydrostatic skeleton. So lots of animals actually have that, although you probably don't, like we have this bias towards animals that are more like ourselves, but lots and lots of animals actually have hydrostatic skeletons. Then exoskeletons, you should be familiar with this as well. Um, this is when you have a hard encasement that's deposited on the surface of an animal, and this is going to be found in mollusks um, and arthropods. So again, arthropods are like your insects. They have an exoskeleton that's made of chitin, and it's segmented for movement, and it has to be shed in order for it to grow. So there's a picture of a cicada breaking free from um, an exoskeleton. It has outgrown, and... Um, I don't know if any of you have seen like those cicada exoskeletons on trees before. I had sort of a weird childhood and my dad was a forest ranger and uh, he would like say it was like a brooch. So like he could pin the little cicada exoskeletons onto you and wear it around. I'm sure I'm probably the only one who did that, but maybe there's one of you listening who did the same thing. And if not, maybe if you see one, you can try it out next time. So endoskeletons. Uh, this is what we have. So this is an internal hard skeleton that is surrounded by soft tissue. This is going to be found in us. It's also going to be found in sponges, which like if you've ever seen like an ocean sponge or felt a sea sponge, they're very, um, they're kind of firm actually, kind of prickly in a way almost. And then echinoderms like starfish, um, and then again, us vertebrates. Um, so minerals give this endoskeletons a firmness. And then there's a really cheesy picture there of a dog who needs a bone, right? Actually it needs several bones. So we're going to um, kind of go to the vertebrates because, again, we're sort of biased towards vertebrates in, in the textbook and just in general here. But vertebrates have an axial skeleton and an appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton makes up the longitudinal axis of the organism. Remember, longitudinal is like the long way, so the up and down way. So it's our axis. Um, and then the appendicular skeleton is appended to that. So it's what's stuck on to the um, axial skeleton. So the Appendicular skeleton is our appendages, right? Our limbs um, and the girdles that hold our limbs in place. So the pelvic girdle and the shoulder girdle would be included in the appendicular skeleton. Um, a joint is anywhere that two or more bones are going to come together. And I think when people think of joints, they think of movable joints, but not all joints are movable. There's actually fused joints, like the joints in our skull. Um, there's pivot joints that allow for rotational movement. Um, so think about turning your head to the left or right, that would be a pivot joint. A hinge joint is just like a hinge on a door that allows movement in one plane. Um, <laughs> I wish you guys could see, I'm doing all kinds of movements here. But if you think about your elbow, you can, um, your elbow in one way acts as a hinge and actually the other way, um, the rotational movement of your elbow is a pivot joint. Um, and then you've got ball and socket joint like in your shoulder or your hip. 
So the first question for a review is, um, is the pelvis in the appendicular or axial region of the skeleton? And that's a pretty tricky one for most people, I think, um, because when you think about the pelvis, you're like, my pelvis is like up and down axis, but the pelvis holds your legs onto your body. So the pelvis itself um, is actually part of the axial Oh darn, I said it wrong. See, the pelvis is part of the appendicular region of the skeleton. It holds your appendages on. So pelvis, appendicular. Um, and then number two says label the joints as hinge, ball and socket, or pivot. Um, if we look at the first one, it's between our first and second um, vertebrae in our spine on the neck, and that's what allows our head to rotate um, left and right. So that's going to be a pivot joint. The next one is at the elbow. Um, you've got the humerus in kind of the ice cream scoop shape part of the ulna, and that allows that to work like a hinge. So that's a hinge joint. And then the last one, you have the head of the femur. That's kind of a round ball shape in um, the kind of socket of the ilium there. Um, and so that's going to be a ball and socket joint. So the joints were... Um, pivot, hinge, and ball and socket from the top to the bottom. So that brings us to bones. Um, bones are organs, and probably most of you are aware of this, but <laughs> for some reason I think people think of bones as like these dead sticks that hold you up, and maybe it's because you think of like, you know, like a Halloween plastic skeleton or something like that, but really bones are living and they are dynamic tissue that is constantly being remodeled. Um, Bone tissue itself has collagen for strength and flexibility. It also has cells, which include osteoblasts and osteoclasts, and then it has mineral components as well. Um, then bone as an organ is going to be vascular, meaning it has blood flow, and innervated, meaning it has um, nerves going to it, which if you've ever broken a bone, you probably know that it's innervated, right? Like you can feel it if you break it. Um, and then bones themselves provide a scaffold for skeletal muscles to work on. So then when we go to muscles, vertebrates have three types of muscles. Um, they have skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Muscles are excitable tissues, meaning they can send and receive information, or they can send and receive signals. Um, what is the other tissue that is excitable? Did you say nervous tissue? Great job, <laughs> right? So nervous tissue is also excitable. So muscles and nerves are excitable. Um, and then as far as the types of muscle go, they're classified according to their structure, their function, and then their control mechanisms. So your skeletal muscle um, attaches directly to your bones, um, hence the name skeletal muscle. Um, it's voluntary, meaning you can control it. And then if you look in the picture on the right hand side, the first one, it has this kind of things that look like ridges. Those are called striations. So we can say skeletal muscle is striated as well. Um, and we'll get into why that is coming up. Um, cardiac muscle is going to be found in the heart and it is involuntary and it can actually generate action potentials um, without neural input. Um, we talked about that a little bit before when we talked about um, the heart. And then uh, cardiac muscle is kind of branching. It has these intercalated discs which allow ions to go from one cell to another and um, it's also striated. Then we have smooth muscle. Um, smooth muscle is called smooth because it's the muscle type that is not striated. And um, sm smooth muscle can be found in hollow organs. Um, it can control the size of them. Um, the contractions of smooth muscles are relatively slow, um, but they can be initiated without input from the nervous system. So like a blood vessel would have smooth muscle. Um, the, your stomach has smooth muscle. Your intestinal tract has smooth muscle. Um, if you have a uterus, that has smooth muscle as well. So invertebrate muscles are similar to vertebrate skeletal muscle or vertebrate smooth muscles, but some groups do have some unique adaptations. For example, the muscles that hold a clamshell close contain paramycin, um, which is a protein that enables long-term contraction with a, lo a low energy requirement. But think about like what that muscle needs to do. It's pretty important to it that its um, cell shell stays closed there. If we go back to vertebrate skeletal muscles, then if we talk about the structure, a muscle is actually a grouping of cells. 
in the muscle, we call these cells muscle fibers now. Um, really, all this muscle anatomy terminology is going to be a little bit frustrating because they start renaming things that already had names. So a muscle fiber is actually a muscle cell. Um, and the muscle itself is several muscle fibers together with um, connective tissue. So a muscle is actually an organ. And muscle fibers can increase in size during growth, but we really don't make that many new muscle fibers. A fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers, and then individual fibers are filled with cylindrical structures that are called myofibrils. The myofibrils are then packed with a thick and thin filament. The thick filament is mostly made up of a protein called myosin, and the thin filament is mostly made up of a protein called actin. And then um, we have many um, repeating contractile units of thick and thin myofibrils, and one of those is called a sarcomere. So some root words that you're going to see when we talk about muscles are going to be myo and sarco. Um, sarco means like bar of flesh, myo means muscle. So you'll see those um, in more things here. So here's kind of a picture of a muscle, right? We've got the muscle here, and then we have a bundle of muscle fibers, which is called a fascicle. Then we have the single muscle fiber, so one muscle cell, and then the muscle cell is packed of many myofibrils, which include the thick and thin filament, and then there's repeating units of myofibrils called sarcomeres here. So the sarcomere is the functional unit of the skeletal muscle fiber. There's about 10,000 per myofibril in humans, and they're made up of the thick and thin myofilaments. The thin filaments attach at the Z-line at the end of the sarcomere, and the thick filaments are anchored to the M-line in the middle. Um, you can see striations or these stripes um, that are visible mi microscopically, and that's where you have an um, overlap between the thin and thick myofilament. So again, if we kind of zoom in on um, the sarcomere, um, you can see areas where there's overlap between the thick and thin myofilament, um, and that appears microscopically as the striations. And down here's a better picture of it. Like here's the thick myofilament, um, and here's the thin myofilament. My pointer got a little out of hand, but um, Hopefully you got the idea there. One's thicker, one's thinner, right? You've got Z lines at the end of the sarcomere and an M line in the middle of the sarcomere. Don't get too hung up on the Z line and the M line at this point. Um, if you take, you know, maybe um, an anatomy or physiology class, so you'll get into more detail on that then. But you're probably going to see it if you do any reading and you're going to see it if you watch any other videos on this. So I think it's worth telling you about. So what is the term that means muscles are able to um, receive and respond to stimuli? Muscles are excitable. They, <laughs> it's, I don't know, cracks me up. They can get excited, right? Some muscles can receive and respond to stimuli because they are excitable. Um, what's a muscle fiber? So a muscle fiber is just a muscle cell, but instead of calling it a muscle cell, we now call it a muscle fiber. Um, muscle fibers are made up of many myofibrils. Myofibrils contain sarcomeres. What are sarcomeres made up of? That would be the thick and thin myofilament, or if you wanted to say actin and myosin, I would take that as well. Um, actin makes up the bulk of the thin filament, and myosin makes up the bulk of the thick filament. So for a muscle to contract, you actually have to have a physical interaction of the protein filaments. Um, so Muscles respond to input from the nervous system, and contraction is an active process and relaxation is a passive process, and muscles contract because the thin and thick myofilament are going to interact with each other. Again, the thin filament contains mostly actin, and the thick filament um, is going to be mostly myosin. So if we start with the thin filament, um, the thin filament again has actin, um, and each actin contains a binding site for myosin, and um, the actin strands are going to kind of intertwine in this uh, helical chain, so kind of a twisty chain. 
And there's also tropomyosin, which covers the myosin binding sites on actin when the muscles are relaxed. So in this picture, the like things that look like little, I don't know, olives, right? That would be the actin. And then you can see this gray piece of licorice. Um, the gray piece of licorice is the tropomyosin that covers the holes on your olives, right? So the tropomyosin is covering the um, binding sites on actin. And then there's a troponin complex in purple here, and that binds to tropomyosin, and it keeps um, the blocking action in place. Um, but the troponin also has a binding site for calcium, which will come up later. Um, because when, actually I'll tell you, because this picture does a great job showing you. So when the calcium comes and binds to troponin, it moves the troponin. So do you see how the little um, olive holes on the actin are available again? The binding site on the actin um, is open. So that would allow myosin to bind to actin. And we'll get to that coming up. So then on your thick filament, um, this is purple in our textbook, but this picture that I found where it's yellow is um, it's a good picture, so sorry for the if that's confusing to you. Um, but myosin is made up of um, six protein subunits, and there's tails that um, lie along the axis, and then there's these heads here, um, and the heads have a binding site for both ATP and actin. So during contraction, the heads are actually going to bind to actin. Remember how the actin looked like a little olive, right? So the head on myosin here is going to bind to that little like olive looking opening on the actin. Um, and when actin and myosin are bound together, we call it a cross bridge that's formed. So the way we describe how muscles contract is with the sliding filament model of muscle contraction. What this says is that um, the filaments are going to slide past each other, and when they do that, it increases the overlap between the thick and thin filaments. And so if we increase the overlap, that means the whole entire muscle is going to get shorter. So if we look here at this picture, right, we have this fixed end, um, and see how there's less overlap here, but there's more overlap down here in this part of the picture. And so um, when you increase the overlap, what happens is the muscle overall shortens. Um, the filaments stay the same size, but since the filaments are overlapping more, the muscle is going to shorten. If you go ahead and put your put one hand on your bicep, so like put your left hand on your right bicep and then contract it, you can feel that that muscle is getting shorter. All right, so why do skeletal muscles appear striated? Skeletal muscles appear striated because there's an overlap of the thick and thin myofilament, or you could say there's overlap of actin and myosin. And where they overlap more, there's the striations or the stripes on the muscle. Um, in the sliding filament model of muscle contraction, what is sliding? So it's not really sliding per se. Like sliding to me makes me think of like people like skating on ice and like gliding past things. But um, the myosin attaches to the actin and pulls it along. Um, so the myofilaments are sliding across each other. Again, sliding in like quotes because there's not really so much sliding. Um, or the actin and myosin are sliding, again, in quotes, um, across each other. So the cross bridge cycle is when actin and myosin actually are interacting with each other. And um, this is what causes the contraction. So with this, you have. Um, Remember, actin in our book is shown in orange. It kind of looks like olives. And then myosin in our book is purple. Um, and so you actually have this myosin head, and it's going to bind to the actin. So ATP hydrolysis provides the energy that's required for the head of myosin um, to bind to actin. What's hydrolysis again? Remember, hydrolysis is breaking apart. So ATP hydrolysis is saying we're taking a phosphate group and ripping it off of ATP. Um, and then the myosin head is going to pull the thin filament with the actin towards the center of the sarcomere. Um, and then it returns to a low energy state as the bond between the filament is broken when a new ATP molecule binds to the myosin head. Um, so here's kind of the cross bridge cycle and step by step in this picture on the side here. So you've got your thin filament, which is actin. You've got your thick filament, which is myosin here. Um, and then 
This myosin head is in the high energy configuration. Um, it binds to the actin and you have the cross bridge and then um, the thin filament is going to be moved towards the center of the sarcomere so your overlap increases and your muscle contracts. The energy for a muscle contraction um, is going to be restored by um, transferring a phosphate group from creatine phosphate to ADP to create ATP. Also, you can break down glycogen, which is a carbohydrate storage molecule, um, to release um, carbohydrates in order to produce ATP through just regular old cellular respiration. So calcium is important for muscle contraction. At low intracellular levels of calcium, um, the tropomyosin is going to block the active sites on actin. So remember that was that um, licorice piece. So the licorice peaks piece blocks the olive holes, right? Um, and that means the myosin can't bind to the actin, so the muscle fiber will be relaxed. But at higher intracellular calcium concentrations, the calcium binds to troponin. Troponin moves the tropomyosin away from the active sites, and so um, that allows the myosin and actin to bind and the cross bridge cycle to occur. Um, and when the nervous stimulation stops, the calcium is actually going to be pumped back into something called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, um, which is just the endoplasmic reticulum in a muscle, and um, the contraction will end. So here's kind of a better picture of the inside of the muscle. Um, so you have a myofibril, right? You've got um, the nerve that's telling the muscle what to do. You've got the muscle cell membrane. You've got this infolding of the muscle cell membrane that's called the T tubule, T for transverse or like a cross. Um, and then you have the muscle cells endoplasmic reticulum, which is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum in this case. Um, and so the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to um, release calcium when it gets a signal that ultimately came from the nerves. So the nerve signal goes down the muscle cell membrane into the T tubules, causes calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that causes the um, the interactions that allow the cross bridge cycle to occur. So when the calcium is, is released, it allows the troponin to remove the trop the blocking action of tropomyosin, and then the thick and thin myofilament or the actin and myosin combined and form the cross bridge cycle. So the neuromuscular junction, um, neuro is talking about the motor neuron, muscular is talking about the muscular or muscle fiber. So this is the junction between the motor neurons, axon terminals, and the muscle fiber. On the motor neuron side of things, we have axon terminals that have vesicles of acetylcholine. There's the synaptic cleft, which is that brief space that separates um, the motor neuron from the muscle fiber. And then on the muscle fiber side, there's junctional folds on the membrane that increase the surface area of the membrane. So there's more space for acetylcholine receptors. Those acetylcholine receptors are ligand-gated ion channels that open in response to acetylcholine um, binding to the acetylcholine receptor. And then when acetylcholine binds to that acetylcholine receptor, there's sodium that's going to flow into the muscle cell. A little potassium goes out as well, but mostly sodium is flowing into the muscle cell, and that leads to a local depolarization. And if that depolarization reaches a threshold value, you get an action potential on the muscle cell membrane. So when we kind of zoom in and look at how the motor neuron stimulates the skeletal muscle fiber, this is one of those things that's going to take me a long time to talk about um, and a while for you to understand, but it happens very quickly in real life. So for this to happen, on the motor neuron end of things, the action potential is going to arrive at the axon terminal of the motor neuron. That trips the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels, and that allows calcium to enter into the axon terminal. That calcium entry causes the synaptic vesicles um, to bind with the cell membrane and release acetylcholine by exocytosis. That acetylcholine is going to make its way across the synaptic cleft, so that little space between, it's gonna diffuse across there, and then it will bind to acetylcholine receptors on the muscle cell's um, membrane. Then that acetylcholine binding will allow um, sodium to go into the cell and a little bit of potassium to go out of the cell. This is kind of our first step here. Um, but this last bullet point that says acetylcholine effects are terminated by its enzymatic breakdown. Um, so that's true, but that's not leading us to 
muscle contraction. That's how we stop muscle contraction. So we can say, okay, the acetylcholine can't keep signaling forever. We've got enzymes to break it down. The one our book talks about is acetylcholine esterase. Um, also, it can be diffused away from the synaptic cleft as well to stop signaling the muscle. So the previous slide was about signaling the muscle to contract. This is like taking that message and bringing it into the muscle further. So once the nerve tells the muscle, hey, contract, like acetylcholine's bound to the acetylcholine receptor. If you reach a threshold value, that triggers an action potential to occur. That action potential is going to be conducted down the T-tubules, which are just infoldings of the muscle cell membrane, and that's actually going to trigger the muscle contraction. So the action potential propagated along the T-tubules um, will cause the release of calcium, um, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, um, and then that calcium will bind to troponin, which moves the tropomyosin and allows the actin and myosin to bind. And then step number four there talks about how we get rid of muscle contraction. So in this case, it says the calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by ATP-dependent ion pumps, and that results in muscle relaxation. So on this slide, we're gonna kind of put all of the pieces together here. Um, so if we start out with um, the neural control, so we have an action potential that arrives at the axon terminal of the motor neuron that triggers calcium to enter into that motor neuron. That calcium entry triggers uh, exocytosis of acetylcholine. Then acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft. It binds to acetylcholine receptors um, on that muscle fiber. Um, on the muscle cells membrane, and then that triggers the entry of sodium ion, um, and a little bit of potassium leaves the cell as well, but that um, leads to a local depolarization, which triggers an action potential. That action potential is uh, propagated deep into the muscle fiber along those T-tubules, which triggers the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is just the muscle cells endoplasmic reticulum. That calcium that the SR releases binds to troponin, which removes the blocking ac action of that um, tropomyosin. So in the picture on the right-hand side there, the tropomyosin is like that gray licorice, and troponin is those purple dots. So troponin changes its shape and removes the blocking action of tropomyosin. So myosin can bind to actin and initiate the crossbird cycle. Um, so that crossbird cycle causes um, the overlap of the thick and thin myofilaments to increase, and um, that increase in overlap causes the muscle fiber to shorten, which causes the entire muscle organ to shorten, and you get a muscle contraction. So do muscles contract when intracellular calcium levels are high or low? When the calcium levels in the cell are high, the muscles are going to contract. Um, tropomyosin blocks the active site on which myofilament? That should be the thin myofilament. Number 10, when ATP binds to myosin, does it attach or detach from the actin? That one's tricky, but it actually detaches. So the contraction of the whole muscle is graded. You don't use the same strength to pick up a toothpick as you would to try and like lift up a car that a baby was under, right? Um, so you don't use the same strength of contraction for everything. And the extent and strength of contraction are under voluntary control. Um, the nervous system can produce graded contractions by varying either the number of muscle fibers that contract um, or the rate at which the muscle fibers are stimulated. So a motor unit is a single um, motor neuron and the muscle fibers it controls. Um, so you can see in that picture, there's two motor units. There's a blue one and a green one, and you can see they're attached to different muscle fibers in the muscle. A motor neuron um, is gonna synapse with multiple muscle fibers. A fiber then is controlled by a single motor neuron, and when a motor neuron produces an action potential, all of the muscle fibers in its motor unit motor unit are going to contract. So the way you get a stronger contraction, one way, is to recruit multiple motor units. So a twitch results from a single action potential in a motor neuron, and if you more rapidly deliver action potentials, you can get a graded contraction. Um, I think when people hear the word tetanus, you think of um, the disease tetanus, which is called by a 
or caused by a bacterial toxin that affects your nervous system and causes um, contractions of your muscles. Um, but in this case, tetanus is a smooth sustained contraction that's produced by rapidly de delivering action potentials. In the disease state, um, you get the muscle contraction because this bacterial toxin leads to muscle contraction. So either way, it's talking about muscle contraction, but in, in this case, on this slide, tetanus is talking about a sustained muscle contraction that is not a bad thing and not going to kill you. Um, in the disease state, tetanus um, can kill you because of your diaphragm, the muscle that is largely responsible for um, you know, helping you breathe, um, if that is in a sustained contracted state, then you're not going to be able to breathe anymore. So be careful with the confusion on that there. But in tetanus, um, muscle fibers can't relax between stimuli. So there's actually three types of skeletal muscle fibers, and we can classify them by their ATP source and also the speed of muscle contraction. So slow twitch muscles uh, are slower and fast twitch are faster. I think that's relatively straightforward. And then if we look at oxidative and glycolytic, do you remember glycolysis? What's glycolysis part of? Glycolysis is part of cellular respiration, but does glycolysis require oxygen? It does not. Um, so our glycolytic fibers are not going to have much myoglobin because myoglobin stores oxygen and they're not going to use it because they're relying on glycolysis, which doesn't use oxygen to make ATP. Um, these fibers do fatigue relatively quickly. Um, also, they don't have very many mitochondria because again, mitochondria are used to um, do aerobic cellular respiration. If we look at our oxidative fibers, we can either have slow or fast oxidative fibers. Um, since they're doing aerobic respiration, they need to have oxygen available, so they're going to have a large myoglobin content, they're going to have um, many mitochondria, and then the slow fibers are going to fatigue more slowly than the um, fast oxidative fibers. So again, same idea here, just written in paragraph form for you. So oxidative fibers have lots of mitochondria and have a high capacity for oxidative phosphorylation, and they depend on blood flow to deliver oxygen and nutrients for ATP production, and they have lots of myoglobin to store oxygen. Glycolytic fibers don't have many mitochondria because they're doing glycolysis, so they have lots of glycolytic enzymes um, and large stores of glycogen. Glycogen is a, a lar large, a polysaccharide, so it stores carbohydrates, can be broken down into monosaccharides um, to run glycolysis. And then they don't have much myoglobin um, because they don't need oxygen, so why would you store oxygen? So they appear more pale or kind of white. So then fast twitch or slow twitch um, are differentiated by their speed of contraction. Slow twitch is going to contract more slowly, but they can sustain longer contractions. Um, our slow twitch fibers are going to be oxidative. Fast twitch fibers can contract more rapidly, um, but they can sustain shorter contractions. And the fast twitch fibers can either be glycolytic or oxidative. So most human skeletal muscles actually contain both slow twitch and fast twitch muscles in varying ratios. This ratio is largely genetically determined, right? Like some people are sprinters, some people are distance runners. Yeah, um, that's something you kind of already knew. Um, but fast glycolytic fibers can develop into oxidative fibers with endurance training. And fa fast oxidative fibers um, fatigue more slowly than glycolytic fibers. So myofilaments attach to the end of the muscle fiber, and the muscle fiber is going to attach to tendons that attach to bones. So the sarcomere contraction is reflected out um, to the entire muscle, and that muscle results in the movement of the bone when it contracts. The skeleton really provides a rigid structure um, that the muscles can work in pairs on, um, and movement results from the coordinated contraction and relaxation of these paired muscles. And in addition to movement, skeletons function in support and protection. So here's um, an example of the human biceps and triceps, and then also um, an extensor and flexor muscle and a grasshopper tibia. It basically works sort of the same way. They work in pairs. Um, if you feel your arm when you extend it out straight, um, your biceps is stretched, but if you contract your biceps um, and bring your fist towards your elbow, like in the first picture, um, your triceps will um, be elongated. 
As far as types of locomotion, most animals are capable of locomotion or active travel from place to place. So we're not just saying, oh, you float from here or there. You're actively going from one place to another. In locomotion, energy is expended to overcome both friction and gravity. Um, and you can see here there's a graph of energy cost um, per kilogram per meter. Um, at a log scale. Um, obviously this is for organisms that are adapted to these particular styles of movement, um, but you can see running is more energetically expensive than flying and swimming. So like we said, getting around on land is energetically expensive. Um, even flying is not as energetically expensive, although obviously like if me and you tried to fly with just our bodies, uh, that would be pretty energetically expensive because I don't have the right um, anatomy for that. Um, but it's so energetically expensive because gravity has to be overcome with each and every step. Um, most animals are going to limit ground contact to reduce friction. The ex uh, exception to that would be like a mollusk, like a slug or a snail. Um, but they're going to limit friction with a mucus layer, um, and then snakes do kind of un undulate, um, and they're kind of an outlier on this though. So in water, the greatest challenge is the density of water. Um, I always think of like my mom does water aerobics classes and I always think of the, you know, old ladies doing water aerobics classes in the water. Um, but if you take one of those water aerobics classes, you'll, you'll know that the resistance um, in that water is pretty, pretty intense. So if resistance increases exponentially as speed increases, so you can really get a good workout doing the old water aerobics. Um, but streamlined bodies of organisms are going to reduce drag and make swimming more efficient. And swimmers have an advantage because they don't need to provide lift to overcome gravity. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different ways animals are going to swim. You know, they can paddle with their legs as oars. They can use jet propulsion um, or they can kind of undulate their body and tail from side to side or up and down. With flying, flying has actually evolved on four separate occasions, um, and there's numerous advantages to flying, like escape, being able to scan a large area, you can live someplace else that nobody can get to you unless they can fly, things like that. Um, but you have to be able to both overcome gravity and air resistance, and this resistance is reduced by streamlined bodies again. So which muscle fiber types are best suited for endurance type activities? Um, your options are slow oxidative, fast oxidative, and fast glycolytic. So our slow oxidative fibers are the best for endurance activities. And then which type of locomotion would you expect to be the most energetically expensive? That's going to be running. All right, so now we're kind of jump into behavior, which is a little bit weird, but here we are. So Nico Timbergen had four questions about animal behavior. The first two address proximate causation or how a behavior occurs or is modified. The second two address the ultimate causation or the why a behavior occurs in the context of natural selection. So our first question we can ask is what stimulus elicits the behavior and what physiological mechanisms mediate the response. The next question is how does the animal's experience during growth and development influence the response? So that's the kind of how questions. The why questions would be how does the behavior aid survival and reproduction and what is the behavior's evolutionary history? So there's a whole field of study called behavioral ecology um, that studies the ecological and evolutionary basis for animal behavior. So a couple examples would be fixed action patterns. A fixed action pattern is a sequence of unlearned innate behaviors that is unchangeable. Once it's initiated, it's usually carried to completion. And a fixed action pattern is triggered by an external cue known as a sign stimulus. Um, so for example, male sticklebacks attack intruding males and the, stig the stimulus for this is the red underside of an intruder. Um, so there's a picture of a three-spined stickleback fish, you can see it as a red undersign, and then they did experiments where they um, set up models and um, the males would actually attack any of the things with a red underside, even if they didn't look very fish-like at all. Um, and if the model didn't have a red underside, they wouldn't attack it even if it looked very much like a male stickleback. 
So I think most of us know what migration is. Um, this is when you have a regular long distance change in location and environmental cues can trigger movement in a particular direction and animals can orientate themselves using either the position of the sun and their circadian clock, their like internal clock, um, the positions of the stars or even Earth's magnetic field. So the daily activity of an animal is affected by its uh, circadian rhythm, which is that daily cycle of rest and activity, and behaviors like migration and reproduction are often linked to changing seasons or a circa annual rhythm, and daylight and darkness are common seasonal cues, and some behaviors are even linked to lunar cycles, which affect tidal movements. In behavioral ecology, a signal is a behavior that causes a change in another animal's behavior. And so animals are capable of communication. Communication is the transmission and reception of signals between animals. And animals communicate using visual, chemical, tactile, and auditory signals. This example is from our book and it's um, animal communication, for example, fruit fly courtship. Uh, so in the first step, a male identifies a female and orientates towards her. Um, he's using chemical communication because he smells the female's pheromones in the air. He's using visual communication because he sees the female and orientates towards her body. Um, the male alerts the female to his presence with tactile communication. He taps the female with a foreleg. Hello, he says. <laughs> um, and then the male produces a courtship song to inform the female of his species. So that's auditory communication. Um, and if all the steps are successful, the female will allow the male to mate. Another example of animal communication is honeybees. Honeybees actually show complex communication with symbolic language. Um, there's a video, it's really worth I mean, I don't know, it's kind of worth watching. Um, it shows the waggle dance and bees, but bees returning from the field perform a dance to communicate information about both the distance and direction of a food source, um, which is pretty interesting. Then many animals use pheromones or odors um, to communicate with each other. For example, male silkworm moths can detect a female moth several kilometers away. A honeybee queen produces a pheromone that affects the development and behavior of female workers and male drones. And when a minnow or catfish is injured, an alarm substance in the fish's skin disperses into the water, which causes nearby fish to seek safety. There are links between experience and behavior. Um, innate behavior, though, is developmentally fixed and does not vary among individuals. Um, we can test to see if a behavior is innate or not with a cross-fostering study, which places young from one species in the care of adults from another typically closely related species. And this helps behavioral ecologists know um, kind of what is the environment's contribution to a behavior um, and what is just innate behaviors. In twin studies, the behavior of identical twins that are raised apart is compared with that of twins that are raised in the same home and that allows researchers to compare the influences of genetics and the environment on human behavior although obviously like there's a whole huge ethics things involved with that um, so that doesn't really so much happen anymore um, learning is the modification of behavior based on specific experiences and the capacity for learning has a genetic basis but environmental influence is a critical component um, for the process of learning. Um, imprinting is the establishment of a long-lasting behavioral response to a particular individual or object. Um, you can see the, um, I think those are baby geese, following um, their caretaker there. Um, and imprinting can only take place during a specific time in development, which is called the sensitive period. Spatial learning is the establishment of a memory that reflects the spatial structure of the environment. For example, digger wasps use landmarks to find their nest entrance. Um, the experiment is kind of sad, right? So they have cir a circle of pine cones around the nest, and if you move the circle of pine cones um, when the digger wasp leaves, it has no idea where its nest is, and it will go into the circle of pine cones to try and find its nest. Um, a cognitive map is an internal representation of spatial relationships between objects and an animal surrounding. So Clark's nutcrackers can find food hidden in caches located halfway between particular landmarks. So animals can actually associate one feature of their environment with another, and we call that associative learning. Um, for example, a blue jay will avoid eating butterflies with specific colors after having experiences um, with a distasteful monarch butterfly. Like, look at that picture. The blue jay is like, okay, I got it. I'm going to eat it. And then it's like, oh, never again. Um, and it really doesn't eat monarch butterflies or other butterflies that look similar to monarch butterflies. 
butterflies again. Um, animals can learn to link many pairs of features of their environment, but not all of them. And different animals are going to do this differently. For example, pigeons can learn to associate danger with the sound, but not with the color. Rats can learn to avoid illness-inducing foods on the basis of smells, but not on the basis of sights or sounds. Cognition is a process of knowing that may include awareness, reasoning, recollection, and judgment. For example, honeybees can distinguish same from different. And problem solving, I mean, this one's tricky because how else do you say like problem solving other than problem solving, right? But problem solving is the process of devising a strategy to overcome an obstacle or how to solve a problem. For example, chimpanzees can stack boxes in order to reach suspended food. So social learning is learning through observation of others and forms the roots of culture. For example, young chimpanzees can learn to craft palm nuts um, with stones by watching older chimpanzees and copying them. Culture is a system of information transfer through observation or teaching that influences the behavior of individuals in a population. And culture can actually alter behavior and influence the fitness of individuals. Um, remember, in biology, fitness is a measure of reproductive success. Um, it's the likelihood that um, the genotype would contribute to the genome of the next generation. So let's match our pictures to the term. Um, up at the top, we've got babies following their mama. Um, that is going to be imprinting. So the first picture will be B. Um, on, if we go, let's go to the right. So the next one down, you've got the wasp and the pine cones and the nest entrance there. So that's going to be D, spatial learning. Um, the next one, we've got a chimpanzee showing another chimpanzee how to crack a nut. So that's going to be social learning. The next one, we have that poor bird who ate the monarch and it is like, I will never do that again. So that is associative learning. And um, A, it's kind of hard to give you a picture of cognition or problem solving, but um, the crow there um, is doing that. So the last picture is A, cognition. So selection for individual survival and reproductive success can explain diverse behaviors. Behavior enhances survival and reproductive success in a population, like for example, foraging or your food obtaining behavior, um, which is a whole bunch of stuff, including searching for, recognizing, capturing, and eating food items. Um, obviously, if you can do that well, um, you're going to get good nutrients, and then you'll be more likely to be able to survive and reproduce and take care of your young. So natural selection is going to refine behaviors that enhance the um, efficacy of feeding. Mating behavior includes seeking or attracting mates, um, choosing among potential mates, competing for mates, and even caring for offspring. And mating relationships define a number of distinct mating systems. So you've got um, monogamy, which is when you have one male and one female. You've got polygamy, which is when you have an individual of one sex that mates with several individuals of another sex. And usually you have um, sexually dimorphic um, differences here. So di means two, morphic is talking about morphology or structure. So um, in sexually dimorphic organisms, the males and females look different. Um, and then this can lead to polygyny and polyandry or poly polygamy and polyandry. So polygyny, I'm kind of emphasizing this because the gyne is talking about um, female. So one male, multiple females. Um, so males are usually going to be more showy and larger than females in this kind of case. With polyandry, um, this is where you have one female with multiple males and females are often more showy than the males in this sort of situation. So here's a couple pictures from our book on that, um, where you've got a monogamous relationship with two birds, one male, one female. Um, down at the elk, you've got one male and multiple females, so that would be polygyny. And then the other picture, you know, they didn't do a great job because you can only see one male and one female, but with polyandry, you would have one female and multiple males. So they really needed to get us a better picture. So the needs of the young can help us kind of understand why different organisms might have different mating systems. 
So if the young need a really continuous kind of steady supply of food, a male is going to maximize his reproductive success by actually staying with his mate and caring for his offspring. So that typically leads to monogamy or something close to it. If the young are soon able to care for themselves and feed themselves, a male actually is going to maximize his reproductive success by seeking out additional mates. So that would lead its way to a one male, multiple female type situation, so polygyny. Um, the certainty of paternity also influences parental care and mating behavior. A female can be pretty certain that the offspring contains her genes. She either gave birth to the offspring or laid the eggs and watched them. Although there are some like brood parasites that can come in and kick out your eggs and then you can raise the, you know, you can raise the young of a totally different species that way. But typically a female can be more certain that her offspring contain her genes than a male. Males are less certain. Um, an internal Oh, sorry, we're going external first. In external fertilization, um, when egg laying and maiden occur together, the certainty is higher, so parental care is at least as likely to be done by males as females in that case. But with internal fertilization, paternity is actually less certain there. Um, so males may increase the certainty of their paternity through mate guarding, which is shown in this picture here. Um, sometimes they remove the sperm from the reproductive tract prior to copulation or produce a large volume of ejaculate. So sexual selection comes into play. Again, sexual dimorphism is when you have two different morphologies in the same species um, where males and females look very different. Um, and then intersexual selection and intrasexual selection are types of sexual selection. Inter is when you have members of one sex that choose mates based on certain traits. Um, this is oftentimes seen through female choice. Um, so this would be like choosing males with specific behaviors or features. Um, and oftentimes this can lead to ornaments like long eye stalks or like think of a peacock's tail, right? Um, and then intra-sexual selection, so inter and intra both mean different things. Um, inter is between, so between the sexes, and intra is within. So um, intra-sexual selection is often going to be seen with like male-male competition. So this involves competition between members of the same sex for mates. Um, and oftentimes you have this agonistic behavior where you have these ritualized contests that determine which competitor is going to um, gain access to a resource. So let's match the following um, and say whether they are intra or intersexual selection. So you've got a peacock there. Um, he's got the showy tail feathers. He shakes them. So that's going to be um, intersexual selection. He's trying to show off for the ladies, and they're going to pick him. Oh, and I guess we're going to do the rest of the pictures <laughs> together. Um, so then if we have um, two males fighting each other in the next picture, that's going to be intrasexual selection with the A. Um, again, we've got two males fighting each other, so that's going to be intrasexual selection. Again, two males fighting each other, intrasexual selection. And then this last one, um, in several antelope species, the males jump really high, and they're like, hey, girl, look at me. I can jump so high. Like, I would be such a great dad. Um, I am so healthy. Um, <laughs> so that is going to actually be um, intersexual selection. So differences in a single gene locus can actually have large effects on behavior in certain animals. For example, male prairie voles pair bond with their mates, while male, male meadow voles do not pair bond with their mates. Um, which behavioral pattern develops in these organisms depends on the expression of a receptor gene um, that is able to bind with antidiuretic hormone, and antidiuretic hormone is also called vasopressin. When behavioral variation between populations of a species corresponds to environmental variation, it may reflect natural selection. So individuals whose behavior allows for a high probability of survival have high evolutionary fitness. And we can expand the definition of fitness beyond individual survival to help explain selfless behavior. A lot of times we talk about like, okay, um, if you survive and reproduce and your offspring are more likely to survive and reproduce, then we're going to see more of those genes later. But um, we can look beyond just the individual survivor, survival and reproduction. So typically when we think about natural selection, we think about um, behaviors that maximize an individual survivor, survival and reproduction, and these behaviors are often selfish. So like competing for food, right, and taking more food, um, things like that. But in nature, um, and even in people sometimes, we observe selflessness or altruism 
And so, you know, sometimes animals behave in ways that reduce their individual fitness, but increase the fitness of others. Um, we can still explain that, though, with uh, natural selection. We can explain altruism by looking at inclusive fitness. If we think about fitness as like the ability of your genes to be seen in the next generation um, or subsequent generations, um, individuals can get their genes to the next generation by either producing offspring or helping close relatives produce offspring. So an example would be a building's ground squirrel will make a predator alarm call to warn others. But if you're the guy making the alarm call, if you're like, oh guys, there's a hawk, there's an eagle, whatever eats you, there's something that could eat us. Um, now the thing that you just called out about can see you. So calling increases the chance of you being killed. However, if you live in a close family group, then you know even if you die, your family is still being alerted. Um, in naked mole rat populations, non-reproductive individuals may sacrifice their lives to protect um, their reproductive queen and kings um, from predators. So kin selection is the natural selection that favors altruistic behavior by enhancing reproductive success of close relatives. So because this is biology, there's math to actually determine this. So Hamilton's rule is a quantitative measure for predicting when natural selection would favor altruistic acts among related individuals. There's three key variables in this altruistic act, the benefit to the recipient, the cost to the altru altruist, and the coefficient of relatedness. Um, and natural selection favors altruism when the coefficient of relatedness and the benefit to the recipient is greater than the cost to the altruist. So you can look at this rule and um, like an example of that would be when a girl risks her life to save her brother or something like that. So we made it through this chapter. Um, this chapter had a lot of stuff. We had skeletons, we had muscles, we had behavior. We tied them together and lumped them together. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to ask me about it.